Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's British Science Week event. Can we bring animals back from extinction? The event tonight explores the exciting world of genetics and ancient DNA, looking at whether it's possible to bring animals back from extinction, and perhaps the more important question, should we? We've got an excellent panel joining us for tonight's discussion, and I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. If you'd like to get involved this evening, please go to slido.com and use code hashtag B163. You can also follow the Slido link in the video description throughout the event. We will, be put, we will be using this to hear from you. You can also submit questions for the panel here and upvote your favorite questions. We'll be trying to answer as many questions as possible over the course of the discussion, but we may not be able to answer everything that is submitted. We also have live captioning available for this evening. If you'd like to see that these, please click the subtitles closed caption button, button in the bottom bar. If you'd like to tweet during the event, please tag at Royal Society and use the hashtag British Science Week. Well, uh, first of all, I'll kick off by introducing myself. I'm Lucy Cook and um, I studied zoology many moons ago. These days, I'm more often found writing. Got a book out at the moment called Bitch, uh, Revolutionary Guide to Sex, Evolution and the Female Animal. There were no extinct animals in my book, but I'm looking forward to finding out more about how those could be brought back to life from the guests this evening. And they are, first of all, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Mike Benton. Good evening. <coughs> um, my name is Mike Benton. I'm a paleontologist at the University of Bristol. I'm interested in dinosaurs and particularly bringing dinosaurs back to life in a different context, not in the sense of DNA, but working out what they looked like. And I will show my book, which was published recently, and this is Visions of Dinosaurs, what they looked like. And in particular, our discovery a number of years ago that you can reconstruct color uh, and, and you can use um, data from the fossils often to learn extraordinary things about what they looked like that people would have thought was impossible at one time. Fabulous, thank you so much. Mike, and now Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Beth Shapiro. Sure, uh, my name is Beth Shapiro. I am a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where it's morning time right now. So if any of my students walk in that door, I apologize in advance. Um, I also have some books. I didn't know we were gonna do show and tell, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I have um, <laughs> one that just came out in October. This is the British uh, version of it. I don't know if you love the little fingerprint piggies, life as we made it, but probably more pertinent to this conversation. My first book is called How to Clone a Mammoth. So if you want to do it, there's the instruction manual right there. So yeah, quite straightforward, really. Looking forward to the discussion. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Beth. Great to meet you. Um, and George Church, finally, please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, well, I feel like I'm the person that maybe forgot to bring to my duck, but here is, here's my book, uh, <laughs> uh, Regenesis. It, it does have a, a mammoth-like creature on the front. Uh, and I, I'm a professor at Harvard and MIT. I work mainly on technology uh, for DNA reading and writing DNA and, and then any of the marvelous um, organisms uh, ranging from dogs and pigs to uh, elephants. Uh, so we, that we engineer in various ways. Fantastic. Well, to get started, um, I hope everybody's got their Slido uh, on, on the go because we'd like to hear back from you on the question. If you could bring back any animal from extinction, what would it be? So we're gonna have a poll on that. So if you could all answer that question and let us know, that would be fantastic. But to kick off the discussion, um, I'm gonna start with you, George, in fact. You're, I mean, one of the pioneers of genetics and gene editing. Could you give us a quick introduction to what this field of science is and why you find it so exciting? Right. So uh, gene editing uh, is part of being able to, to write, uh, cha make changes in the genome and how it uh, uh, plays out um, in uh, microbes, in plants, animals, and human. Uh, it's uh, 
something like uh, gene editing can be considered very broadly where you're introducing DNA, uh, new DNA, or you're changing uh, in a small way or in a large way. I mean, it's really, uh, it's a very broad term, it can be. Um, and, and when we use it in humans, it's usually termed gene therapy. Um, and, those, and something very much like gene therapy is involved in the vaccines that we've just, uh, many of us have taken for uh, uh, COVID-19. In, in, in agriculture, it can help uh, uh, plants deal with uh, pests and things like that uh, without using uh, chemical pesticides. <clears throat> and then with animals, it's used for veterinary use in very similar ways that we use in humans. And then finally, um, we, we can uh, use, you can, we can make very radical changes in a, in a genome to um, adapt them to, uh, uh, to uh, transplant for transplanting organs or uh, to fill a niche that uh, has disappeared as a keystone species or as a, a endangered or recently extinct species. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, George. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 it says that the technology is, has, has multiple uses. So this, this bringing animals back to life is really just sort of one aspect of, of this technology. Um, and Beth, I'd, I'd like to turn to you now and just sort of, you know, when we talk about genetics for bringing extinct animals back, we, we can't just go out and collect DNA as easily as we can from humans or animals that are alive. How, how do we find this ancient DNA and how is it still usable after such a long time? Um, I'm, I'm just watching the Slido too. So I like this idea of uh, people putting in what they want and the Dodo is currently winning just so everyone knows. It's, uh, it's very exciting for me. This is a very exciting time. I'm a very big fan of the Dodo. It was the first animal I worked on. Um, <laughs> uh, so how do we get how do we get DNA? Uh, actually, it is pretty straightforward. Um, the, the problem is that once an organism dies, the DNA that's in all of its cells starts to break down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until eventually there's not enough left that's gonna be useful. But we have all sorts of technologies that allow us to go out into the field, mostly in cold places, because you can imagine just like when you stick something in the freezer compared to in the fridge, compared to leaving it on the surface, if something is really cold, it stays better preserved for longer. So a lot of early work in ancient DNA, the field that I work in, has been in cold places like the Arctic, which is one of the reasons we know so much about mammoths, right? They lived in cold places, and so we find their bones. And we can go there and grind up a little piece of that bone and digest it to release all of the DNA. And then we can look at each of those pieces. And we've learned something about these, these fragments. They tend to be really short. Things like UV light can hit the DNA and break it into smaller and smaller pieces, just like happens during life when we go outside and where we, why we wear sunscreen, right? Also freezing and thawing will break the DNA. And then most importantly, microbes, things like fungi and bacteria, they get into those samples and just chew it all up, digesting it to make it turn into something else in the future. Um, but we can go in there and extract this DNA. We get millions or billions of these tiny little short fragments of DNA. A lot of it is that microbes, the bacteria and the fungi, but some of it will be mammoth DNA, maybe as much as 10 or 50% of the DNA that's in there will be mammoth DNA. And then we can take those little tiny fragments and we map them using a computer to the elephant genome, which we've sequenced from living elephants, and see where along that genome sequence each of those little tiny fragments goes. And if we sequence enough of it, we can build up a scaffold where we can see all of the places in the whole DNA code of an elephant and a mammoth where the two species differ from each other. And that will give us the instructions that we need for doing what George was just talking about, which is going into that elephant cell growing in a dish in a lab and gradually tweaking it a little bit at a time using the tools of gene editing to cut out the elephant bit where it's different from what we now know a mammoth looked like and paste in its place the version that was the mammoth genome. So we can go out and get DNA from an extinct species as long as it's relatively recently extinct. Um, dinosaurs, I guess, we'll have to talk about in a little bit, but, uh, and we can do that relatively straightforwardly. The next steps are, are harder. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Th thanks so much, Beth. Um, I'm going to I'm just going to remind the audience now of the um, of the Slido code. When you go in, you've got to you've got to use hashtag B163. And we're getting some great questions in already. And one of them, Beth, I'm going to follow on because it follows on from what you were talking about is um, RV Lee Willingham has asked, how do you would you account for the epigenetics of de extinct uh, de extinct species? You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that we don't really understand about what parts of our genomes make species look and act the way that they do. And one of those is the idea of epigenetics. This is, you know, what happens in the environment that makes some genes turn on or turn up or turn down or turn off. Um, we don't really know how to reconstruct these in living species. There are ways that we can use molecular biology to figure out where there are epigenetic markers in genomes, so that's possible. But knowing what of those are actually important to making an animal look and act the way it did is really hard. Um, but I think one of the things that I would say in defense is that we know that the environment is super important to making us all look and act the way we do. Um, if, if it weren't, then identical twins, which are essentially genetic clones of each other, would be completely identical. And we, we know that they're not, right? So obviously environmental influences, which include epigenetic changes that will change gene expression are going to be important. Are they going to be so important that it means we're not going to create an Arctic adapted elephant if we want to use this gene editing technology. I tend to doubt it, but I will push that over to George. He's probably thought about this a little bit as well. Yeah, I was going to say, what does George think on this? Yeah. Uh, I uh, basically agree with Beth uh, that it's uh, we're, we're, we're getting quite good at, at manipulating epigenetics and that and that kind of knowledge and technology is improving exponentially. Uh, for example, we have, uh, um, you know, a couple of companies that, that, that their whole point is to, is to manipulate epigenetics uh, to make organs for uh, transplant or, or other things like that. And uh, so, and that's, and that's the epigenetics of going from a fertilized egg to a, an adult. And it is environmentally sensitive, but we also are understanding how to manipulate the environment uh, so that they, they go where we want them to go. So I, th there are certainly are gaps in our knowledge, but it's amazing what one can engineer uh, without knowing everything. Uh, I think we need to be humble about how, how little we know, but how little we need to know uh, and have historically known um, uh, and still um, sometimes gotten very powerful technologies. So for example, uh, smallpox vaccine, uh, it uh, was done at a time when the, almost nothing was known about viruses or immunology. Nevertheless, it had a very positive impact on uh, a very scary disease. Fantastic, thank you, George. And I'd like let's go, let's go over to Mike now with one of the questions that that is proving to be very popular on on Slido, which is. Has anyone ever bought an extinct animal back yet? I don't believe they have. And, and we people have been trying with recently extinct species, but Beth will maybe correct me, Pyrenean ibex and various others. People have got close, but it's been quite tricky. And of course, all of this started in a, a popular way with the, the film Jurassic Park back in 1993, which was from a very smart um, uh, novel written by Michael Crichton, who in fact had had a training in biomedical sciences. So he was very aware of what was going on. And if we go back to 1993, I think everybody's either seen the film or are aware of the scenario. And generally people thought at the time, could this just about happen? Now, of course, I think we have a more sophisticated understanding. But back in 1993, um, the polymerase chain reaction PCR method had been devised, was coming into wide use. Michael Crichton was aware of this, and it gave the opportunity to take very tiny, tiny samples uh, and clone them and sequence, and, and that had not been possible before. And then this opens the possibility of looking at ancient DNA. And I remember the series of papers that were happening, and in a way, fiction was ahead of fact. And people were reporting DNA from ancient insects. You'll remember that the scenario of the film and the book were that um, 
blood was inside the stomach of a mosquito that had sucked the blood from a dinosaur. And the scientists were, and, and the, the mosquito, the fossil mosquito was preserved in amber so that every detail could be seen. And hence the assumption was it would be very beautifully well preserved. And somehow the scientists extracted this tiny amount of blood from the stomach of the Cretaceous 100 million year old um, mosquito. Using PCR, they were able to clone it, multiply it up to substantial quantities, inject it into a frog or some living animal, and that it would somehow take over the DNA within that living animal. So that was the, the scenario. And there was a series of papers culminating in 1995, 94, where somebody did say, we've got dinosaur DNA. And they said, this is dinosaur DNA because it's different from the crocodile. It's different from the bird. But very quickly, it was pointed out the reason it was different was it was human and that they had mistakenly got a little bit of sweat or something that one of the technicians uh, had dropped into the PCR machine. It had multiplied it up. And technically, at that point, that showed people they had to be really, really careful about ancient DNA. Yeah, we call those the dark days of ancient DNA, where we were still really trying to figure out what was going on. And, and it turns out that contamination like this is super common. And most people who have ancient DNA labs now, they have these specialized facilities where everybody goes in and they wear this full body gear. It's like going into a crazy virus lab, except rather than protecting you from the samples you're working with, we're protecting the samples from us. You know, some of all of those really ancient bits of DNA that were published, the insects, the dinosaurs, it was all proven to be contamination of different types in the early days. And, and to date, the oldest DNA that's been recovered is, um, it was actually published in January of last year. It's a, a mammoth, some mammoth genome sequences from bones that were preserved in permafrost. So this is soils that was that have been frozen since the time of deposition, which is probably the, the only reason they've survived for this long. But they're thought to be around 1.2 to maybe 1.5 million years old. This is hugely old. Until this, the oldest sample was a horse that we'd found in Canada that dates to around 750,000 years old. But that was also exceptional. And most ancient DNA samples that we have date to the last couple of tens of thousands of years, really within, definitely within the last 100,000 years, um, any older of which then it it's, tends to be really, really poorly preserved. I also tried early in my days of ancient DNA, while I was at Oxford, in fact, to try to get DNA out of insects preserved in amber and also out of amber that didn't have any insects in it. And I always got something, you know, there's always DNA in things, but it was never what I thought it was going to be. It's clearly a contaminant. Uh, so even if we try really hard not to get contamination, we have to look carefully at all the results we get to make sure that it isn't something that is going to mess up our results. So it's, it's not straightforward, but it's possible now to have the right sorts of controls and, and really look carefully at these sequences to see, to see, to make sure that we're, what we get is authentic, but we can do it. <laughs> so it's, it seems to me that scientists are feeling pretty, pretty punchy about this. Like this is, this is definitely something that, that, that's within our power to do. Is that, is that, a, is that a resounding yes? Well, it depends what you mean by this. If, if this means get DNA out of old remains, then yeah, we know we can do this. And it's really exciting. And we can learn things about how species and populations and entire ecosystems have changed with big environmental changes, like the peak of the last ice age and the rapid warming after that, or the first introduction of a predator. But if this is de-extinction, then it starts to get a little bit more hazy. And, and I always say, is de-extinction possible? Well, it depends on what you're willing to accept as a de-extinct species. And I think everybody who's genuinely working on this isn't thinking we're gonna bring something back that is 100% identical to a species that was here or a particular organism that was here and is now extinct. Because we know for reasons like we can't sequence whole genomes, we don't know about epigenetics, we don't know about environmental impacts, we can't really piece together all these differences, that this isn't, this isn't possible, but organisms are more than their DNA sequences, so we can't reconstruct an environment that no longer exists. 
But can we use these technologies to create an organism that is similar in what it provides to its ecosystem, to something that used to be alive, and potentially use that as a way of reinvigorating, reinvigorating that ecosystem or restoring missing ecological interactions or missing components of ecosystems and helping to make that ecosystem healthier? Yes, I think we're getting to a point and in different ways with different species, you know, uh, we know a lot more about mammals than we do about birds, for example, but we're certainly pushing toward a point where we can use these technologies to do just that. Fantastic. Well, we've got a great question that sort of really follows on from that. That's uh, the most popular question at the moment. George, I'm going to come to you with it. It's from Orla. Um, and she asked, would it be easier to bring back an extinct plant as opposed to an animal? Uh, probably the easiest thing right now is, uh, to engineer is a, a mammal. Uh, so of the animals, a mammal is slightly easier to engineer. Um, and, and plants, uh, so, so I have a, 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 an agriculture seed company that's engineering plants, uh, but there's special issues. I mean, they have the advantage that every, almost every part of the plant can produce a new plant um, rather than just sperm and eggs for, for a, a typical mammal. But you can change it so that, so that you can derive from almost any cell in the mammal a stem cell, and then, and then it's just like the plant. So I think in general, mammals are easier, but they're all feasible they're, they're, um, to do. Um, and in terms of ancient DNA, we have plenty of ancient plant DNA. That's that's quite true. Uh, it, it all boils down to what you want. Uh, so it, I, you need somebody to advocate something in an ancient plant that isn't uh, already present in the wide diversity of plants. In general, one of the, some of the enthusiasm for bringing back parts of the ancient world. Uh, you know, we're not talking about specific species, but but all kinds of specific genes, which you can bring back um, some of the gene functionality from billions of years back, even if you can only bring the DNA back from 1.2 million years. Uh, and those genes can have can, can be used in a whole variety of, of ways. Uh, uh, so, so, for example, uh, restoring diversity to a species. Um, we can, we're, we're no longer limited to the herd, the last herd uh, or the last few animals. We can go all over the world and backwards in time to get diversity. So that's, that's one key reason that, uh, that we might want to go back in time and reach for individual parts of the plants or animals. I've got a I've got a question here that's that's very popular. I, I'm going to ask um, Mike this question. There's a lot of people want to know: Is the dodo genome fully sequenced? Fully sequenced? Do we? Is is the dodo something that we could bring back? It's very popular in the poll as well. Yes, and I, I can see why it's popular because obviously the dodo is such an amazing bird. We know it's related to pigeons and doesn't look much like a pigeon. And human beings, of course, wrote about it, illustrated it, and, and saw it alive, and, and then exterminated it. The dodo genome is known and has been sequenced, not in its entirety, but, but substantial amounts. Um, and it's one that you could make a case to say, well, yes, maybe that would be interesting. Because I think a question that you raised before that we haven't fully got to, of course, is what do you do if you bring something back to life? And if you've seen the Jurassic Park films, that raises rather obvious conclusions. If you bring T-Rex back to life, maybe that wouldn't be the most popular thing because uh, it would run wild and cause havoc. Whereas people have talked about mammoths and they have a known habitat that is potentially available. The dodo has a known habitat that would be potentially available. And we could say bringing back something that isn't so ancient uh, would be much more feasible in terms of impact on the environment. Um, in terms of actually engineering that dodo, I think you would face all the problems that people have faced and that, that Beth and, uh, uh, was talking about and George about um, the reality of generating a whole, uh, a whole new species, whether you could inject parts of that dodo um, uh, DNA into a modern pigeon DNA and somehow generate a dodo, I've got no idea it would probably look nothing quite like what we expect a dodo to look like. 
can I also answer this question? Um, because yes, the dodo genome is entirely sequenced because we sequenced it and it's not been published yet, but it does exist. <laughs> And we're working on it right now. Um, uh, we have a fantastic specimen. I tried for a long time to get DNA from the specimen that was, that's in Oxford. In fact, it was the very first ancient DNA project that I worked on. We got a tiny little bit of DNA out of it and we're able to show that it's most closely related to a pigeon called the Nicobar pigeon, which is a gorgeous pigeon that is broadly distributed across the Indian Ocean. Um, but it's that particular sample didn't have sufficiently well-preserved DNA. I don't really know much about its preservation history to get a whole genome, but there is a specimen in, in Denmark at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen that we were able to, through collaboration with the curator there, get a small piece of. And now we have a, a very high coverage, high quality dodo genome that will, will soon be, be published. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, for birds though, as far as bringing them back, and this is one of the reasons that George said mammals is simpler. Um, one of the key steps that everyone is considering when we're thinking about this is, is if I have a cell and it's living in a dish in a lab and I've edited it so that it used to be a Nicobar pigeon cell and now it has a bit of dodo DNA or it, or it was a or is an Asian elephant cell and I've stuck in some mammoth DNA, replaced bits of it. So it's now it's more mammoth like. How do I then transform that cell into a whole living, breathing, actual animal, right? And, and the way that we would do this is to clone it uh, using somatic cell nuclear transfer, the same approach that, um, that, uh, that was used to create Dolly, the most famous clone, right? Um, we can do that with mammals. Um, we can't, we don't know how to do that with birds. Uh, because of the intricacies of their reproductive pathway. So there needs to be another approach for birds. So this, this one really fundamental technological hurdle in de-extinction or reinvigorating new genomes or bringing back individuals and things like that is a, is a technical hurdle that we've yet to cross with birds. Now, there are groups that are working on different approaches for doing this, and I have little doubt that we're going to get there, but it is an, an additional hurdle for birds that we don't necessarily have for mammals at this point. So we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to wait. The dodo is probably not going to happen before uh, some some kind of rat. In fact, was it was in the uh, was in was in the news today that's uh, 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 being talked about. Um, the Christmas Island, Island, Island rat. Yeah. Yeah, the in... Christmas Island rat. Yeah. It, it's. It, I, I feel like it's. It's. It's likely to be some sort of small brown mammal that's that's likely to be the first creature that that comes forward. Is that. Is that feel because we know more about them. You know, we yeah. know, know more about their rats. We've had in labs as model animals for a long time. We know a lot about rat reproduction and how to keep them healthy and happy in a captive breeding environment. We know a lot about how to how to make them reproduce, and this is helpful when we're doing this. These are all different technical hurdles that one would need to overcome to do. To to do this type of work so yes yeah probably will be something that we understand a lot better <laughs> i mean i i personally i i I'd, I'd, I'd love to see a dodo i mean who wouldn't love to see a dodo maybe maybe less keen on another rat being on this planet but i think that brings us interestingly to the poll that, that uh, we'd like to i'd like to throw out to the audience um on the slido.com we've got the, the results of the last poll Lots of people like me want to see the dodo, the dire wolf, which I, I, I'm going to have to look up, actually, because I don't think I know the dire wolf um, is, is incredibly popular. And the thylacine, which, of course, um, fantastic marsupial from Tasmania that would be amazing. There are people, obviously, I've met in Tasmania who actually think the thylacine, thylacine still lives. So uh, it, it might be easier to see that again. But uh, interesting to see your results, a huge range there of, 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 of species that people are keen to see come back. But the next poll that I'd, I'd like you to answer um, on Slido using the hashtag B163, of course, is, is what concerns you most about potentially bringing animals back? Because, you know, as we've been saying, you know, bringing a bird back, bringing the dodo, not massive impact, but you know, bringing back mammals, bringing back dinosaurs. What would that mean to the planet? So, so if we could um, just, uh, if you could answer that, that would be fantastic. I'd like to to set that poll going, and that brings me to the most popular question, actually, because from talking about the the practicalities of how we do this, we're sort of moving on to the kind of ethics of this, really, which is 
Um, the most popular question currently on Slido is from Alicia Ingle, which is how would bringing back the animals benefit them and the ecosystem? For example, if we were to bring back an animal, how can we support it with the habitat loss and invasive predators? Um, how about Mike? Do you want to have a go at that? I'll, I'll have a go and uh, <clears throat> I certainly can't give a complete answer, but I think that does relate to the point of, uh, it also relates to the technical feasibility because as we've heard from Beth and George, it's, it's easier to do this where you have close living species. Um, and I think ecologically speaking, this would be the same issue that um, if you bring T-Rex back or a giant sauropod dinosaur, what on earth do you do with the blasted thing? And, and then how many do you bring back to make a breeding population or what's the point? And technically, practically, ethically, it could be potentially a, a nightmare. And of course, in the Jurassic Park films, they have them living on some mythical island. We don't know quite where that island is, but of course that's meant to keep them safe. But then there's also the risk they're going to escape and the flying ones get away and all that kind of stuff. People have discussed that for the mammoth, they've discussed it for the dodo. And I think in these cases, we can see what the habitats were. Some of those habitats still exist, but there would still be a, a lot of issues. Who looks after them or who takes responsibility? Um, would they be capable of living in the wild without a lot of support or are they just going to be curiosities in a zoo? Um, th those are my thoughts. And, and I, in a way, the ethical issues are there. Um, the technology may someday uh, confront us with actually solving these. Beth, I'm sure you've thought about this. Do you, do you have something to add on, 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 on this question? Sorry, I was muted. About the uh, environmental impact or? Yeah, the question was, 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 um, was about, you know, should we be doing this? You know, what, 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 you know, what would be the, 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 um, the, the, the benefit to, to doing this to the environment? So, you know what, I, I think that this is going to be, it's different depending on what species that species we're thinking about. And every species is going to have different technical, ethical, and ecological challenges that it has to address, but they also have different rationale for wanting to consider it. To my mind, I think that the most exciting thing about these sorts of technologies is that as they are being developed, and, and, and you know, I think everybody loves the idea of de extinction because it allows them to think outside the box and be creative and really engage with something that's exciting. But the same technologies that you would need to create a mammoth or an Arctic adapted elephant would be useful for conserving and protecting species that are alive today. Um, I saw one of the questions that have, was posted was about Willa, for example, this, this black-footed ferret that was cloned recently. These are the same technologies that one would need to develop for de-extinction. didn't involve any gene editing, but what happened was a team of researchers at the San Diego Zoo and Fish and Wildlife and a nonprofit called Revive and Restore worked together to take some cells that have been frozen from black-footed ferrets for almost 40 years and use cloning to create a living, breathing animal from those frozen cells. And what's critical about this animal, she's named Elizabeth Ann and she's adorable and you should look her up because there's, you know, she's just an absolutely adorable little black-footed ferret, is that all the black-footed ferrets that are alive today um, are derived from seven founders, seven individuals that are all very closely related. This is a highly endangered species that is really on the brink of becoming extinct. The only reason they're still alive is because of this successful captive breeding program that's been established about a decade ago. But Willa, her DNA is entirely different than the other the other individuals that are there because she's from a different population. And so when she reaches breeding age, she's going to be reintroduced into this community and provide a super welcome burst of genetic diversity. Now, this is really great for black footed ferrets, but it might not be enough to save them because there is one other thing that uh, they are facing, and that is plague. 
that's been introduced into their populations. And so when a black-footed ferret goes out and eats a prairie dog, which is their favorite prey, the prairie dog is often infected with plague. The black-footed ferret gets plague and it dies. So just introducing genetic diversity might not help them. They can be vaccinated, but they have to be caught and revaccinated. And this is not a really great long-term conservation strategy. However, there's another solution that comes from the family of technologies that would be needed if we were going to successfully de-extinct a species. And that is that the domestic ferret, which is an evolutionary cousin of the black-footed ferret, is naturally immune to plague. So this group of researchers are right now trying to figure out what it is in the domestic ferret's genome that makes them naturally immune to plague. And once this is discovered, they can use these same technologies, growing cells and dishes in lab, gene editing those cells, moving DNA between species, in this case, from the domestic ferret or potentially another species into the black-footed ferret genome to make it naturally immune to plague. It's the same technologies that one would need for de-extinction, but here applied explicitly for the purposes of keeping a species that is currently endangered from becoming extinct. And one can imagine other ways that we would use this. If we could identify um, genes that make corals better able to survive in warmer or more acidic waters, we could use these technologies to move those genes between populations and species. Even the work that's being done to help figure out how to create an Arctic adapted elephant could be useful to help protect elephants from becoming extinct. So I think there are so many amazing opportunities that will come from development of this suite of resources that come from people's excitement about de-extinction, not just limited to bringing these back. And there are so many potentially amazing impacts on populations and ecosystems if we have these technologies as yet another tool in our conservation toolkit, that this is why I'm excited about pushing these, these approaches forward. I like the comment from one of the uh, uh, commentators, uh, I'd like to taste some of these extinct animals, but then that's another ethical dimension. If you're going to create them, they could cause havoc in ecosystems. If you only create them in order to be able to eat them, well, that's <laughs> another matter. <laughs> Maybe, but you know, hunting and hunters were absolutely critical to the early conservation movement at the turn of the 20th century. And I think, um, you know, we really have to think about all the different ways that we might, I mean, as people, we're incredibly good at changing our environment to make it a better place for us. And if that means creating new sources of food, particularly if we're talking about plants or engineering things that are going to make our lives easier or better, then maybe it's easier for us to find the motivation there for developing these technologies that will also be useful just for protecting and preserving species and ecosystems. So I wouldn't dismiss it just out of hand, but yeah. We, there's, there's another interesting question from, from Arve Lee Willingham here that's, that's got a lot of votes. Um, how can we ensure de-extinction is a purely ecological process and inhibit it from turning into a commercial one? Um, couldn't this process, uh, once possible, be turned on its head and be used for unecological reasons, i.e. private collections and mass farming? Um, who wants to go to George? Yeah, so there, there's a, not that fundamental a difference between a nonprofit and a profit uh, in, in practice. Uh, there can be. Um, either one of them can do uh, uh, very very good things for society uh, if, there, if, there's, uh, if there's sufficient motivation. So for example, there are carbon credits, which is a way that you can reward companies uh, for doing the right thing in terms of uh, global warming. Um, and that's a way of aligning incentives uh, uh, for, for, for both nonprofit and for-profit uh, organizations. Uh, <clears throat> There's nothing that stops a nonprofit from making a lot of money. So, for example, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation made billions of dollars on a drug that that helps people with cystic fibrosis. So that's that's part of it. The other uh, part of it is it, they they can do well by doing good by by bringing technology that will help um, in a medical sense, in a veterinary sense, or in a uh, in environmental sense is almost all the technologies that we're using that are positive uh, in the environment, um, you know, had, had a, a component that was commercial. That's how you, uh, often how you bring things into the real world is you get, uh, and if, 
And it's sort of up to us as citizens and consumers to vote with our wallet to, to say, this is what we want uh, to spend our money on. So if we insist on spending all our money on the uh, domesticated animals that we're going to eat, and we now and that now that now constitutes 60% of mammals are, are human domesticated mammals, and, and 96% if you include humans themselves. Um, so if that's what we want to do, then that's what the commercial farms are going to produce. But if we decide we want to be vegans and and uh, eat uh, plants, that's going to be a, a different outcome. So it's don't blame it on the companies, blame it on the consumers. That's a that's a a, a fair comment. I, I uh, one one of the other questions that's very popular here at the moment, which is another sort of ethical question, which is, um, you know, how would would de extinction not be detrimental to living species conservation as the view would be to preserve genetic material because it's it's fine we'll bring them back later i mean you know we we conservation is you know really underfunded as it stands and you know is there a danger of of of, of you know de extinction it's a fantastic exciting idea but but could it distract away and make people just sort of feel like they can just carry on eating meat and 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 you know driving SUVs and not really caring because science will just sort it out and, and just bring those animals back from extinction it'll all be okay and 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 uh, we don't have to worry about the habitats is that is that something that we have to be worried about do you think Beth? So I think that this assumes something both beautiful and incorrect, uh, kind of separately about people. Um, first, it assumes that most people care about de-extinction and would suddenly that not do so. Most people care about conservation and would suddenly not do so if this were possible, which I just unfortunately think isn't true. People don't really care about extinction in as much as it doesn't impact them personally. Maybe that's not true about the people who've come here, but the people who've come here to listen to this are probably not your average person out there. It also assumes that us, the people who are here listening to this, who do care about conservation, are all of a sudden going to stop doing so because some technologically particularly difficult thing that is not going to bring back an identical copy of something else is now going to save the world, which I think it's unfair to imagine that we all believe that that is true true, right? So we understand that there is challenges here. And I also think that one, one of the comments that we often get is that, you know, these efforts are taking away from resources that would otherwise go to, to conservation, which I also think isn't true. I mean, the, the people who are funding traditional conservation are not the same people who are funding this sort of research. I mean, if you saw the news last week, there's a company out there called Colossal that I'm consulting for that um, just raised $75 million. These are This is not money that's come from the same people that are out there trying to save the panda or the koala. Um, it is, it's in my mind, absolutely fantastic that this sort of crazy technological solution that may not ever work has brought in so much new money and new excitement to a field where it is so hard to get funding. I think that quite the opposite to, to the accusations of taking money away. It's actually bringing new money in and it's money that is sorely needed for technology that I think has tremendous potential to help conservation. Well, it, it's certainly something that concerns the uh, the, the audience because a lot of these questions that are coming through are, are, are exactly you you preempted that question, Beth, and I, you've been in enough of these discussions to 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 know that that's that's on the cards. And so it's it's obviously something that concerns people. I've got another one here, which is: this, Will this later become a biohazard risk? I.e., will it be possible? Will it possibly bring back contagious diseases that could impact other species? Obviously, that's something that's very much on our mind in these days. So, uh, who who fancies answering that? Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, since my laboratory does work on infectious diseases, we worked uh, on on uh, diagnostic therapeutics and vaccines for COVID nineteen, for example. Um, I think this is a reason for not bringing back an exact copy of a, of a uh, ancient species blindly, just blindly turning ancient DNA into modern DNA. I think we should do it selectively. We should do it for enriching uh, endangered species and modern ecosystems, and we should do it one gene at a time because there are 
um, viruses lurking in the genomes of organisms. Um, for ex and in fact, the only two the only two genomes that have been actually fully brought back uh, from extinction are viruses. There's a, a retrovirus and an influenza virus that have been brought back from extinction. Uh, for I, uh, you know, we didn't do it, but, but I think for good reasons, other people did it. Um, but we don't want to just go in and recreate random viruses that hap just because they happen to be in the mammoth genome or some other genome. Uh, we want to do it more thoughtfully and say, these are the cold resistant genes that, that would enrich the current elephant species, would allow them to, to, to extend into vast regions where there aren't, aren't human beings. Um, we, we've eliminated, we've even gone the other direction, we've eliminated dangerous viruses from the genome of pigs, completely eliminated them, proven that, and now those pigs are more suitable for providing uh, medical resources uh, like organs. Uh, so you, you, you can do it either way, but you just have to be very um, uh, cautious, I think, is the point. And and where would we? I mean, there's, there's there's I mean, there's a lot of these concerns around around this area, and and also you know that they wouldn't survive in our ecosystem, and 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 how would they affect existing ecosystems? Um, is there anybody who wants to 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 tackle any of that? I suppose I can just say a very brief word. I mean, we we talked earlier about this. People have talked about the mammoth and the dodo. And they are in a position, I suppose, where nothing has replaced them uh, in their former habitats to a certain extent. Um, and then in that case, you could imagine reinserting them and somehow recreating the ecosystem that, that was already there. Whether in practice that could ever happen, I don't know. But the concern, of course, with, with more um, um, randomly doing this, of course, bringing species back uh, and, and planting them here and there on the earth could be catastrophic for all sorts of reasons that we've discussed and we have species at risk today bringing back former species who knows it it, it wouldn't necessarily improve the chances of other species to survive i, I mean I've, I've got to ask you do you, do you do you do you ever see a dinosaur coming i mean obviously we have dinosaurs we have birds you know but do, do you think that that's a, a reality that could happen one day mike no, I think uh, it, this is what got people thinking so much because of the Jurassic Park story. But um, the, 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 all the steps along the way, as Beth was, and, and George were outlining, make it very, very unlikely that that would happen. What has been done is engineering of the genome of living birds to try to recover deep within that genome remembrances of genetic fossils of dinosaurs and, and very early in um, genetic engineering people were able to um, in a sense trick the genome of chickens into generating teeth and there are many experiments of that kind where people can get horses to generate multiple toes and these sort of atavisms or throwbacks and those approaches might work but whether you would call your chicken with teeth a dinosaur i've got no idea <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and the other thing, of course, that we haven't discussed is is behavior. You know, I mean, how how would how would an animal that's that's been brought back to life, you know, de-extinct, how how would how would it behave? How would it how would it how would you tackle that, George or Beth? Beth, you're up there. I was just going to say, you know. It the genome is the blueprint for all of this. And then in combination with the environment and you know, things that an individual can learn from its parents, I see there's a, a, a question about how something learns uh, to act like, like a, it, how you bring something back that is born to an elephant and how do you teach it to become a mammoth? I think you know, this is, these are all things that are different. You know, this will, what is behavior? It's a combination of the genes and the proteins that are made and the environment in which the individual lives. And probably it's loads of genes that are interacting with each other in different ways in the environment. I guess my, the thing that I keep coming back to with this is, 
does it matter? You know, if, if we really are trying to target something in particular, like we want to create an elephant that's just able to live in the cold so it can wander around and stir up the, the sediments and move plants around and interact in a way that a mammoth used to, does it matter that it's not 100% identical to a mammoth if the goal is to just create something that can fill that niche and, and replace some of those ecological variables? And I would say, it doesn't. You know, the, the goal is not to create an identical copy of an animal that used to be alive because we know that we can't do that. And so when we're considering these projects, we really have to think why we want to do it, what the ultimate goal is, do these risk assessments about whether the ecosystem is going to be impacted in a way that we can predict by putting these things back back in an environment or putting a proxy for something that used to live there back in the environment. And in many cases, you know, we, we don't, we're not going to be able to fully understand the impacts of these changes before we do it. But we do this all the time because as people, we have been moving species between habitats because we wanted to <laughs> for as long as we've existed as a lineage. And sometimes it has terrible, devastating consequences and sometimes it doesn't. But you know, ecosystems are not stable either. You know, there's we don't have an ecosystem that an extinct species, a species disappeared 10,000 years and it's just stayed there in this it's time frozen and waiting for this thing to come back. That doesn't happen either. You know, even the, the dodo's environment is different from Mauritius. If we wanted to bring a dodo back, we would have to first solve the problem that made them go extinct in the first place, which is that there are loads of rats and cats and pigs and dogs that people introduced onto the island that ate the egg that the dodo laid on a nest on the ground. And until we can solve that, if we were to recreate a bird that laid an egg in a nest on the ground and stick it there, that egg would just get eaten the way the dodo's eggs were. So all of these things are, yes, they're problems that people in the audience and people elsewhere have correctly identified. But does that mean that we shouldn't imagine what these technologies might be able to do? Are, are the risks of things that we don't know or can't understand greater than the risk of not allowing ourselves the freedom to explore what these technologies might be able to do to save species and ecosystems that are under threat today? I don't think so. We take risks as people all the time. Yes, we should have to evaluate them and we should have global conversations like we are right now about what these risks are and what risks we're willing to take as a global international community. And it's great that we're doing that before these technologies really exist, right? But I worry that people are so scared of things that they haven't yet thought of that they should be scared of that we're going to stop ourselves from really moving down this road, from, from identifying what these technologies can do to help us to protect species and ecosystems today. As the, the people have correctly pointed out who are commenting, there are millions of species that are at risk of becoming extinct. These tools could be tools that we can use to stop those extinctions from happening. And it's a tremendous risk not to allow ourselves to evaluate the tools. Okay, well, uh, we're sort of coming towards the end now. And I, and I guess to sort of wind up, um, let's start with you, George. Where, where do you see this field going in the next 10 years? And, and what do you think that scientists will actually be able to achieve? Well, I think it's, it's safe to say that it is, where it's going is going there exponentially fast. That is to say, we have brought down the costs of things of, of both medical and veterinary significance by 10 million fold, most of it in the last decade. Um, so that's giving you some idea of how fast this is going. I think it's also going in a, in a good direction. It seems like the people that are uh, donating money or investing money are more and more motivated by climate change and by um, uh, cert, uh, s uh, species that are endangered than, than, than anything else. Uh, and so, so I, I think that it bodes well for the next five, 10 years. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, we're gonna have uh, many of the technologies we've talked about here will be considered routine and available for uh, veterinary and um, uh, endangered species probably far more than, than extinct. The extinction is just a, the rallying cry. It's, it's a way of getting diversity um, into modern species for the benefit of ecosystems 
admittedly, they will be benefiting ecosystems that humans like. <clears throat> if, it, if we can make an ecosystem produce uh, less uh, methane into the atmosphere, then that's, from a human standpoint, a good ecosystem. It's not good in some kind of global perfect way, uh, but their technologies may avert um, massive extinctions if, if, heaven forbid, 1,400 gigatons of methane is in the Arctic were to go up into the atmosphere, that would be a global warming far beyond any of the predictions uh, that have been based purely on anthropogenic sources. Um, so that's just an example of, where, of both where the technology is going and where the applications are going. Well, I think that's a, it's a good place for us to ask our final poll from the audience, which is, you've heard the scientists have spoken. Do you, the audience, think that we should bring animals back from extinction? So please answer that. Um, what are we looking at now? We've got a, we've got, oh, it's a yes and a maybe, not many no's and not many I don't know's. It's uh yeah, the yes is the, the, the uh, you've, you've been very persuasive. You've um, you've convinced the audience. There's there's uh, not a lot of no's coming, although, although they are creeping up. But no, that it is. People believe in, in, in this as a as an exciting future for um, for our planet. I think it would be nice to say, do you think we should develop these technologies? Uh, we don't need to bring species back from extinction to capitalize on these technologies for the purposes of preserving biodiversity. And that, I think, is where I'm, I'm most excited about this. And that's why I would vote yes, add maybe yes. That's a great clarification, Beth. Yeah, so, so in, the, in the end, de-extinction is a sort of a kind of a buzz thing, but actually that the technologies from what we've heard today are, are have, a, have a much more... A, a wider use. Well, I mean, it's been completely fascinating to uh, to hear from you, and we could we could talk about this for, for many many more hours. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring the conversation to a close now. But it has been completely fascinating. Thank you to all of you who have joined us. Do do continue the conversation on social media. Tweet us at Royal Society and use the hashtag British Science Week. Um, Please subscribe to the Royal Society's YouTube channel to stay up to date on the latest events. Alternatively, you can find out the latest information on the Royal Society's website or by signing up to their newsletter. The link can be found in the YouTube description as well as one of our short evaluation surveys where you can tell us what you thought of the event. You can also catch up with this discussion and all of our events on the Royal Society's YouTube channel. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Mike Benton, George Church and Beth Shapiro for such a fascinating insight into a really exciting science. And that's all for tonight, viewers, and well, we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>